Well, I absolutely think that China is, is an alternative economically and politically. And I think many countries around the world can learn from China. Also, an advantage of the Chinese system is that the Communist Party would never, ever say that another country should simply adopt our system. That's the whole point of the concept of socialism with Chinese characteristics, that each country, its social system is a product of unique material conditions, and those material conditions should should be manifest, or, or the, the social system should be manifested based on those specific conditions, that each country should have, can learn from China's model, but also implement it according to its own national conditions. And there are a lot that we can, there's a lot that we can learn from China. First of all, that, okay, China doesn't have the same system as the Soviet system. And honestly, after studying more of the Soviet system, I, I think the Soviets accomplished a lot, um, providing job guarantees, social benefits, very good quality of life for everyone and not just a small percentage of the population. But I think also, I think a lot of people will probably accept now that having a complete command economy with no market forces is also probably creates its own set of problems. And I think China has been experimenting, sometimes leaning more in one direction than the other with how trying to find how to balance planning and a market. Because there's this idea that after the reform and opening up in 1978, that China completely abandoned planning. That's not true. China still has five year plans. And in addition to the five-year plans, which are very macro-level plans, China has very specific plans for targeted industries, like, for instance, electric vehicles, which are referred to as new energy vehicles. China created a plan for how they're going to develop an electric vehicle industry, which was very successful. And you can call it industrial policy, but unlike U.S. industrial policy, which is really just giving subsidies and tax breaks to big corporations, but not actually... Um, disciplining th those firms in any ways, certainly not using state-owned enterprises, not investing significantly in infrastructure, not making targets for certain, uh, you know, not making benchmarks for where these firms have to for these firms have to meet. I mean, Chinese industrial policy is much more complicated than just saying we're going to give tax breaks and subsidies, and it's been remarkably successful. But you also I think they recognize that you don't have to have every single hotel and restaurant and you know uh, low-level enterprise run by the state, especially when many of these enterprises are actually they they're um, they're profit losing and then that's a drain on the state. Um, so, you know, there are people in China who have criticized the reform for going too far, especially in certain regions like the Northeast, the Dongbei. Um, which led to deindustrialization of the Northeast. So, I mean, obviously, if you look in, in the past 40 years in China, there have been periods at which the, the political economy has leaned more toward the state and more to, and planning and, and less toward the market in moments where it's leaned more toward the market, especially in the 90s, it was kind of like a Wild West period. But we're in a period now where the state is reasserting more control and something that a lot of people can learn from, from the Chinese economy is I think every country should have this idea that China has where the state-owned enterprises are concentrated in the commanding heights of the economy. And we can sit here and argue about what percentage of GDP comes from state-owned enterprises. It's, it's an interesting argument. I don't think it's insignificant. Um, but I also think it kind of misses the forest for the trees because when we just measure GDP and say number go up, therefore good, it, it misunderstands that certain industries, certain sectors of the economy are much more important. So we see this in the US where people say, look, G US GDP number go up. But then you realize that much of that GDP growth has been in the healthcare industry, which is horrible, completely privatized dystopian. It's been in finance, which does not contribute to actual, uh, the real economy in, in tangible ways that make people's lives better. And it just means increasing loads of debt. Whereas you look in China, the state-owned enterprises are concentrated in the most important sectors of the banking system, which should be publicly owned everywhere, uh, in telecommunications, in infrastructure. And if you look, for instance, China, it's true, does have now over 100 companies that are listed in the Fortune 500 international of the biggest 500 companies around the world by revenue. But 
the vast majority of them are state-owned enterprises and their SOEs, which are concentrated largely in infrastructure development. Whereas the U.S. has a bunch of SOEs in finance, some in big tech. China's is, is, SOEs are concentrated in these, these tangible industries that are used to, to actually make people's lives better and more comfortable. Um, there's also public transportation. I mean, when you compare the U.S. and China, it's, it's, a, it's a joke. I lived in New York for several years, New York City. The public transportation in New York is, is atrocious. I mean, it is honestly shameful. This country that claims to be the richest country in the world, which it is not, and this city, which is really the only major city in the U.S. that has a very well-developed public transportation system. There are smaller metro systems, subway systems in, you know, L.A. and Chicago and some other big cities, but they're not very well-developed compared to New York. And it's 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 a joke. The U.S. subway system is falling apart. There has been a major lack of investment. It's extremely expensive, despite the fact that you know that uh, the the well actually that's making up for the fact that there's no there's not much significant investment by the state. It's now like ar around three U.S. dollars for one trip on the subway, and obviously you have to adjust for different income levels. But in China, if you go on most on most subway trips, it's like three to five to seven yuan, which is between like 30 cents to 70 cents to one dollar, depending on how far the trip is. So, I mean, uh, it's just again, even if you adjust for income levels, it's I mean, it's outrageously expensive in the U.S. for this horrible system. You just look at photos. I mean, I've been on on uh, the subway in, in, in New York City, in metro stations that you just look around you and everything's falling apart. It was obviously the subway station was built in like the 60s and it has never been updated, never been renovated. Um, there's also the issue of safety. I mean, the US is an extremely violent country and why that is, it's a very complicated social phenomenon. Obviously, a big reason is because there are an, there's an insane number of guns. There are more guns than people, more than 400 million guns. It's very easy to get a gun. You can just go uh, to a Walmart in many states and buy a gun without a license. Um, that's obviously part of it, but it's not just that. There are people who point out that you know there are higher, go higher rates of go gun ownership or comparable rates of go gun ownership in Yemen and Switzerland. And so, I mean... The U.S. is just simply a deeply violent society. You could say it goes back to their, its origins in settler colonialism, it, the, the apartheid state that existed in the U.S., the brutality of slavery and Jim Crow. I mean, the point is, is that in China, there's nothing remotely comparable. China, at least in the big cities, I mean, I've been to the countryside, but I haven't lived in the countryside, so I can't speak from experience. But in the big cities where I've lived, I mean, there is no violent crime. Basically, it's non-existent. I mean, very, very isolated instances. I mean, and especially talking to female friends, like the 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 freedom that they have, being able to go out at night whenever they want and not being afraid, that is a freedom. Like the, there's this idea that the U.S. has that we're the freest country, which is nonsense. You're not free if you're afraid of going to school or grocery store because people are going to shoot you. You're not free if you, as a woman if you're afraid of going out at night because you might be attacked. Whereas in China, that is a major social freedom that people have. And then getting back to the political system. I mean, I, people will say, you know, I'm a, an authoritarian, all this nonsense propaganda. The U.S. system is authoritarian. The Chinese system is objectively less authoritarian. I will I will absolutely defend that argument. So for instance, the you go to the U, any major city in the US, in, in addition to all of the violence that I was talking about, all of the mass shootings, police are everywhere. The US is a deeply militarized society and police are heavily armed, not with just guns, but with military equipment that is given to them and fire sales by the Pentagon because they have to justify all of these contracts for the military industrial complex. So all of this old military equipment, they sell for pennies on the dollar to local police departments. So you have all of these reports of local police in small towns in Texas who are driving around in armored vehicles. It looks like they're in a war zone. The US is one of the most militarized societies I've ever been in. I've been in a little over 30 countries and by far, the U.S. is the most militarized. It has the most police, the most guns everywhere you go. 
people are the most afraid of the state, not just, so I also spend a lot of my time living in Nicaragua, another country, I'm also a dual citizen of Nicaragua, a country that is demonized endlessly with ridiculous propaganda in Western media. Meanwhile, in Nicaragua, there you only see a small fraction of the police. There are no, almost no guns. People are not afraid of the state. They're not afraid that the state is gonna brutalize them if they argue with a cop. What's funny in China is it's very common to see people argue with police, especially elderly people. They're constantly yelling at police and they don't do anything. If you yell at a cop in the NYPD, they will, they will arrest you. They will attack you. I mean, we've seen these recent reports in the US of, uh, of someone who jumped the turnstile in the subway, which is, so they didn't pay like $3 and they were shot. And by the way, not only were they shot, other people around them were shot at. So, I mean, there's this obsession with the political system and saying that it's only about elections. The U.S. is supposedly a democracy because every four years, a candidate funded by billionaire oligarchs who supports war and genocide around the world, you can choose between one of these nearly identical candidates. Therefore, you're a democracy. China is supposedly not a democracy because they don't have bourgeois elections in the same way. Although actually, by the way, China does have local elections for representatives in the National People's Congress who represent, and they also have elections for representatives for, for local assemblies. I mean, there are elements of local democracy, electoral democracy in China. China has what it refers to as a consultative democracy and whole process people's democracy. In fact, at my website, Geopolitical Economy Report, we published an article that goes into detail explaining how Chinese consultative democracy works. But even in addition, in addition to that, the reality is that the Chinese system is more democratic in the sense that the government is more responsible to what the people want. That's the definition of democracy. It's not having an election every few years for representatives of capitalist oligarchs and the military industrial complex. In China, when, when people demand a policy, when there are protests, the government almost immediately responds and implements those policies. Whereas in the US, when people protest, the police brutalize them, they arrest them, they attack them, they run into them with armored vehicles. As we've seen, don't, let's not forget the massive protests in Black Lives Matter over years, not just the, the protests at the end of the pandemic over the killing of George Floyd and, and just the brutal police brutality that we could see. I mean, objectively speaking, the U.S. state, in terms of the way it deals with its people, is one of the most violent states on earth and how it brutalizes its people. Over a thousand years killed every year by U.S. police. There's, but the problem in the U.S., and not just the U.S., in fact, in Europe, it's worse. There is this obsession with bourgeois democracy. It is a religion. They deeply believe at their very core that you have to have elections every four years for four years for some representative of the capitalist class who is funded by big corporations who will, uh, will obediently do what they want and will not do what the people want. But if you don't have that, you're authoritarian. It's just so, it's a deep religion. They believe in, elect, in bourgeois elections, despite the fact that they know that these politicians will not do what they want. I mean, it's so funny. You, you hear people at the same time say, Oh, the U.S. is a democracy. The Western European countries are democracies and China is a, a dictatorship, supposedly. And then they'll also say, oh, yeah, well, all politicians are corrupt. All politicians, they ignore us. They don't do whatever we... It, what? That, that's not a democracy. Democracy is rule by and for the people. And if you recognize that your political class are only representatives of big corporations and billionaires, it's not a democracy. It's a plutocracy. That's what actual capitalism is. It's democracy only for the capitalist class. They control the state. And you can see this even reflected in some mainstream scholarship. There's this famous study that was published by scholars at, at Princeton and Northwestern University. And they looked and they did a quantitative look at policymaking in the United States. And they found quantitatively that average people have no influence, negligible to no influence on policymaking. Meanwhile, large corporations, uh, lobby groups, they determine what policy is. That's not a democracy.
one of my first experiences in um, the U.S. was meeting this couple uh, in my neighborhood who said that they were recently diagnosed with diabetes. And they said that now a significant portion of their income goes in buying insulin. And I was like, I mean, I knew about the insanity of U.S. Uh, healthcare system, how the insurance company and you know, the whole system is actually a for-profit system. But I was so stunned listening to how much of their income goes into insulin, even coming from India, which, whose welfare state has always been very, very limited. But because we didn't protect the intellectual property rights, uh, most people, I'm not talking about the uh, very poor, and India has a lot of very poor who might find it difficult to buy insulin. But generally speaking, for even lower middle class, people would not struggle to buy insulin, even though in the recent years, uh, pharmaceutical prices have risen in India, but it's nowhere close to what it is in the US. And one of the one of my first experience in China was to go through these mandatory health checkups. Um, and I was a foreigner, so it's not subsidized. And I got like 19 checks, including blood test and ECG for just uh, 350 yuan. That might be like 49 or $50. Uh, this I think is like, um, you know. Do you have health insurance? Um, I, I had to buy a health insurance in China when I was okay. there. Uh, it, was, it, it was very cheap. Um, but, uh, because obviously depending on the plan, the health insurance plan is very cheap and depending on the plan, it, it'll be absolutely nothing, I but yeah, it's not surprising. Health, I, I, I didn't have the health insurance when I had the checkup because the checkup was on the first day when I arrived there. Um, but that was the difference. I'm also glad, and this is essential to understand global capitalism, given how much of capitalism share, uh, even GDP share today comes from healthcare, uh, along with, of course, uh, fintech and, uh, uh, you know, real estate and so on. Um, uh, one last point on security. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. go ahead. No, on, on the point really quickly on, on healthcare, I just want to mention, in the United States, the most common cause for households, the most common cause of bankruptcy is medical debt. And the, the most common form of medical debt is cancer treatment. So, you have a lot of people in the US who get cancer or some other very significant diagnosis and they literally go bankrupt. They lose all of their savings and have to end up selling their homes because they were trying to pay for treatment to not die. I know, this is obviously anecdotal, but I know a woman uh, in her 40s who got cancer pretty young and she had a house and she had to sell her house in order to pay for her cancer treatment. And she had insurance, by the way, because even with the copay and all of that, like you're still, you're paying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And that's have, supposedly the richest country in the world. That's supposedly the freest country. I have some of these experience in the US in, in, in dental care and most insurance would pay lip servicing and we cover dental care, but they would never pay for any, any even the most basic like cleaning up your two teeth or even root canal or something they, they never cover. And I met many poor people in neighborhood of Chicago, Englewood, for instance, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago, where people uh, literally went bankrupt because uh, they couldn't afford dental care. Uh, and and uh, real quick on the security, I mean, I was very impressed uh, in China to, uh, to, to realize how safe Chinese cities are. And it's, uh, I'm so glad you spoke about the gender uh, uh, component, I'm sorry, uh, because Coming from India, I mean, we don't have guns as well, so we don't have this militarized state, um, you know, violence uh, in the in the U.S. sense of gun fires and, and so on. But Indian cities are incredibly unsafe for women, uh, and I was so pleased to see so many women and children coming out in the streets at eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, uh, and not just in Beijing, but even the smaller cities. I went like in Suzhou. Uh, and by the way, like even the smaller cities uh, and the bigger cities, they are not very different qualitatively speaking in terms of infrastructure, right? Um, so uh, it's a very different lived experience, uh, definitely. Um, I want to, uh, co we're coming to the end. If you and, Wait, sorry, yeah. can, I, can I make one quick Please, note? Yes. I just want to say that, and there are some people who say this is cultural. They say, oh, it's because... The Chinese people are culturally, they're not as prone to violence. I think that's a ridiculous argument. 
This is a product of good government policy, of state policy, because if you look at China for hundreds of years, there are always, you can talk to anyone from China, obviously they weren't alive then, but people, there's this, uh, there are so many stories of bandits of because the Chinese state was so weak for thousands of years, right? There were warlords. And the reality is that it's very common throughout Chinese history that there was a lot of instability, violence, crime, organized crime, obviously in Hong Kong until relatively recently. Um, so that, and Chinese culture has not changed that much in 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 this time. Like this idea that they're just inherently peaceful. And then even if you look, since the revolution, there are elderly people in China who who lived back through the 40s, 50s, 60s to, 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 to today. And they have I've spoken with some elderly people who've talked about the massive difference they've seen in, in safety and how they, that's one of the biggest accomplishments of the, the revolution. I really think obviously we it's so important to talk about the poverty alleviation, 800 million people being lifted out of poverty, the infrastructure development all of that, but safety is is so important. And this idea that it's just cultural is nonsense. It's because if, if it's supposedly just cultural, then why was there so much violence in the past? The reality is that when you have a government that is committed to social stability, to, in, to reducing inequality, which of course inequality is a big driver of crime, reducing poverty, which is a big driver of crime, providing opportunities, stable infrastructure, and obviously there is an element of security. So it's true that there are a lot of cameras and everything, but they're actually used in a way to maintain peace. I mean, what what that that's the most important thing that people want is a sense of stability and peace. And it's also a necessary precursor to development. I mean, it's a complicated catch-22, right? Because in order to reduce crime, you need to have you need to reduce social instability and inequality and poverty. Because there's this, I mean, there's there are racists who say, oh, it's just because, you know, uh, these minority groups in the U.S. or blah, blah, blah. It's nonsense. It's racist. It's poverty results in more crime. This is true everywhere around the world. And so you need to have poverty reduction. But in a, and also in many developing countries, in order to have poverty reduction, you need to have social stability. So it's a very complex social problem. How do you bring about economic development and social stability and reduce crime? And China managed to do it. And I think that everyone should try to study how they did that. On, on gender also, China has a very recent history of being very patriarchal. So it's not that you know, they have been, uh, there has been gender equity for a very, very long time that we see so many women and children on the street. These are definitely very recent progress that has been made in China. And, and you realize that when you speak to women in China, uh, um, I, I wanted to pick up on uh, something that you mentioned, uh, the leftward shift uh, in recent years in China in terms of government policies. And I wanted to pick up on that because the Financial Times, uh, the leading you know, uh, business press, if you like, uh, reports a lot on China, sometimes obsessively. And their um, bashing, China bashing ground is very different from, let's say, far right, hawkish, uh, uh, conservative, uh, they would mostly talk about um, the leftward shift. They don't usually mention that, but they would say Xi Jinping's policy of overregulation. For instance, uh, yesterday I read about this report on venture capital, and they said that for decades now, um, from 2000 onwards, Chinese innovation was driven by venture capitalists that led to like a trillion dollar award. And now venture capitalists are leaving because of what's happening with Alibaba or Tencent um, and uh, you know, not allowing market valuation on, in the stock market and, 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 and so on. Uh, uh, and even with the other uh, you know, analysis with the slowdown in macroeconomics and so on and so forth, their main line of attack is over-regulation, party meddling with markets, not letting the markets work. So could you tell us a little bit about What's your uh, reading of this leftward shift in China in the recent years? Well, I will say that that report in the Financial Times caused a huge scandal on Twitter. And there were many people who pointed out that the data they used were actually incorrect. And in fact, one of the sources that the FT quoted for that report on the fall in venture capital funding 
one of the uh, the owners of the database that was used, he who's it's a Chinese firm that collects his data. He tweeted out saying that it was it was incorrect the report. So the FT journalist who wrote that has faced a huge backlash, and it does seem to be a completely misleading report. But despite the fact that the data I think are wrong, the and the conclusion overall is wrong. It's this very hysterical thing, this hysterical claim that that uh, innovation in China is collapsing. It's nonsense. There is an there is an element of truth in that. The government has been cracking down on speculative investment, which is obviously good. I mean, that's something that that should be welcomed. But when we look at venture capital funding, there is this narrative that the FT promoted and that and anti-China hawks promoted that China can't innovate without private VC funding, which is nonsense. In reality, Stanford University published a report that found that the Chinese government is responsible for six times as much capital investment as private VC in what is known as venture capital funding. Six times more state investment than private investment. And it also misunderstands where innovation comes from. Even in the US, which is supposedly like the utopia of VC, of, of uh, venture capital and also private equity, we know there are a lot of private. It's funny that VC and private equity often get linked together, but we we know that actually a lot of private equity funding goes into buying up hospitals, veterinarian clinics, nursing homes, uh, businesses that were maybe not doing super well, but at least were not not losing money. They they do these leveraged buyouts. They take on huge sums of debt. They they uh, then sell all of the assets owned by these companies like their real estate and then they rent that real estate and then uh they they trap all of these companies in debt and then they go bankrupt this happened to red lobster this happened to toys r us um there are so many reports that private equity in the us that has been buying up these hospitals that that the services are significantly worse the costs are significantly higher because, I mean, it's an easy business model. It's easy to explain. They Not only do they they trap all of these companies in debt and sell off their assets, but then they also lay off huge parts of their workforce. They force doctors to see twice as many patients and nurses to see twice as many patients. There are higher rates of death in nursing homes. It's a disaster. So it's funny that private equity is being used as a measurement to see how innovative the Chinese economy is because you can call that innovative, but you can also call it destructive, suicidal, parasitic. Um, obviously, VC is a little more complicated because PE and VC are not exactly the same. But the reality is that even in the US, there's this narrative that US technological innovation comes from the constellation of VC investment firms in Silicon Valley. But that misunderstands where a lot of this innovation comes from. And this has been acknowledged even by some mainstream economists who are quite good, like Mariana Masucato, um, in her famous book, The Entrepreneurial State. Um, she's someone who's done a lot of consulting for the U.S., for Western government. She's not in any way, you know, like this kind of radical. She's a little heterodox, but she's she's relatively welcome in mainstream economic circles. And Mariana Masucato has shown how all of this major um, technology we use today ultimately comes from government funding largely through the Pentagon. So the U.S. had never really abandoned industrial policy, even in the peak of the neoliberal era in the 90s and early 2000s, when industrial policy was basically considered tantamount to socialism and central planning. Even then, a lot of industrial planning was, uh, was industrial planning, industrial policy was done through the Pentagon and through things like DARPA. And she points out that DARPA is the Pentagon's brain, as it was famously referred to in Annie Jacobson's book, uh, The History of DARPA. She's like the kind of semi-official government, government-friendly journalist who's like given the job of writing these books um, about the CIA and the Pentagon kind of with their approval. And anyway, the point is, is that um, the Pentagon was responsible for the creation of technology like GPS, touch screens, um, many computer technology, the internet itself, as um, Yasha Levine showed in his brilliant book, Surveillance Valley. So there's this idea that you can't innovate unless you have a bunch of VC capitalists who are just investing in all these firms.
I'm not saying that 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 doesn't lead to innovation at all. I mean, there is some innovation. I'm not, I'll be fair. Not all of it is useless, although a lot of it is useless. A lot of it you get like, you know, um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, you know, like these people. By the way, that's another big part of, of U.S. GDP growth and, and supposed financial innovation is people like selling each other cartoonishly inflated JPEGs of monkeys. And that contributes to U.S. GDP growth and innovation, right? So what happened in China? In China, the government recognized that there was some of this speculative investment going on and they cracked down on it. And the government has emphasized that they want investment, including from private firms in the real economy, targeting specific sectors. And this is also leading to this discussion of the Chinese equity markets. Now it's true that the Chinese stock market, if you have invested in it in the past decade, you've probably lost money. Whereas you know the S and P 500 has skyrocketed in the U.S., the Nasdaq has skyrocketed because U.S. policy in the U.S. is created to on behalf of stockholders, and the U.S. government is committed to inflating the value of assets, and and especially because not only are are capitalists funding the U.S. politicians who are making the policies, but also U.S. politicians themselves have a vested financial interest in inflating asset prices because they're all invested in the stock market as we see with these huge scandals that we've seen no con we've seen no consequences for of insider trading in the US Congress where all of these i mean most of the major congress people in the US are trading using their insider information that they have which is by definition insider trading and they're massively out outperforming the market and there are no consequences meanwhile in China Government policy is not done on behalf of the stock market. So, you know, some ultra leftists who criticize China will say China is not socialist. They have stock markets. Well, look at look at the capital markets in China. They have all been performing horribly. If you are a capitalist invested in the Chinese stock market, you're probably losing money. And by the way, you know who a lot of the investors are anyway in the Chinese capital markets? They're institutional investors. A lot of them are state owned. They're pension funds, they're insurance companies. Um, so anyway, the point is, is that um, if you look at ch the Chinese investments that are being made, they're often being done in a way where the state says these are strategic industries where we want uh, electric vehicles. We want innovation in batteries. We want innovation in semiconductors. So basically what the government does is they say, OK, we will allow private investment in these certain targeted sectors. What we will not allow private investment is in these sectors that are bad for social stability, like private education. So one of the problems that China saw in recent years, which is a very real problem, is that wealthier people in China were spending a lot of money on private tutors, including private tutoring companies. So what happened is that their children would go to school and then after school, they would go to these private tutoring companies, which, by the way, is also horrible for their kids because they have no social lives. They're all stressed out all the time. But what happened is obviously poor and working class people in China. I mean, obviously, uh, absolute poverty has been eliminated. The government has has lifted 800 million people out of poverty. But that said, there's not absolute poverty, but there still is relative poverty. There are still low income people in China and they couldn't afford this private tutoring in these companies. So the government, it actually banned most private tutoring companies and is, is really trying to encourage more equity in education because in excluding international schools, all of the other schools are public in China. So they're, they're really trying to encourage equal access to opportunities and resources for low income and high income children. Um, that's one example. Another area where they crack down is obviously real estate. There were a lot of real estate firms that were engaged in, in these very financial speculative practices where, so for instance, Evergreen, Evergrande, um, Evergrande was supposedly a real estate company. It was actually kind of more of a financial company posing as a real estate company. And basically their business model was just pumping up the real estate bubble by taking investments to, to build, uh, to ostensibly build real estate, but then they were using all those investments to fund further to, to fund past construction that didn't finish. So what happened is you had this kind of Ponzi scheme where 
you they get a bunch of investors who say, oh, we're going we're gonna to buy an apartment in this building that doesn't exist yet. And then they use that capital in order to finish construction in past buildings. So you have this bubble that keeps growing and growing and growing. And the government said, we're not going to bail this out. And actually now, so and so obviously shareholders in Evergrande lost all of all of their investment. And, and furthermore, what's happening now with all of these projects that were left behind that were unfinished. Um, also, there were there were a bunch of corporate bonds that were that were taken out by Evergrande. And there was discussion of whether or not the government would bail those out as well. And they did not bail out those those corporate bonds, even though there were some institutional investors invested in Evergrande bonds. So they, they really did not bail them out in any way. And instead, what's happening now is that some local governments, the the national government in China, because it's actually more decentralized than people realize, the national government makes policy. It's not a federal system. They make policy, but then they allow local governments to determine how the policy will be implemented, right? And they oversee financing. So in the local governments, um, the, the federal government, it's not a federal government, excuse me, the national government, it's not federal. The national government made a policy recently that encourages uh, the state in the local governments to use the unfinished housing to finish it and turn it into social housing. So now um, local governments in China are creating different um, funding programs to finish the unfinished Evergrande housing and turn it into low income housing for low income workers, for migrant workers. Okay, so they cracked on that as well, um, which is also a way of reducing inequality, right? Because um, one of because China has significant capital controls, and this is I want to make a quick point. This might seem like kind of an aside, but when we talk about China's socialist system, I think it's so important to understand that if you think of it from the perspective of a capitalist, right? What is one of the main determining elements of capitalism of the capitalist mode of production? It is that workers are forced to sell their labor power for wages, and capitalists extract their surplus value. Okay. But how is that surplus value stored? In what form? As, as Marx said, you know, capital is dead labor. But what form is that dead labor held in? Well, in the, in, in, yes, the most basic form is, you could say, an, a, a currency, right? But we all know that capitalists don't actually hold their wealth in currency. It's not a very good store of value. They invest that in some kind of asset. Well, in China, there are very significant capital controls. I think it's only 50,000 US dollars can be exported per year. And it's a little different for exporting companies, but for individuals, I think it's 50,000 US dollars worth of um, ex uh, uh, that can leave the country. So, so unless you're doing something illegal, which it does happen through like Hong Kong, Macau, there's like some shady black market operations to like get a, to export capital. It's a, you know, to get across out of, out of the capital control policies. But the reality is that most capitalists in China have to hold their assets in the form of Chinese assets or simply government bonds, Chinese equities. We've already talked about how Chinese equities have been very badly performing, probably lost money. And it's, it's ultimately held in the form of some kind of asset that the Chinese state has control over because all of the major banks are state owned. So meaning that all of your savings accounts are actually effectively state owned. So all of that surplus value that is produced has to go into some kind of asset unless they're violating the law that the state has control over. Obviously, government bonds are funding government um, spending. And then even you look at real estate, that was really the only major investment. You could say also equities. But in the end of the day, even if a company is not state owned, the Chinese Government often owns golden shares, which give them veto power over important decisions made by big companies like Alibaba or Tencent. So it's a way of making sure that the that the surplus value that is ex that is exploited by capitalists is still held in the form of assets that the Chinese state and the Communist Party party ultimately has control over. And what, really, one of the biggest investments that people could make was in real estate, and a lot of personal wealth in China was tied up in real estate. And it is true that over 90% of people, about 90% own their houses that they, that they live in. But to be honest, a lot of those houses are very humble, right? So it's it's like a small apartment or in the countryside, a lot of people in the countryside, they have like, you know, a very humble house. It's not very good.
The government has invested in modernizing these houses as part of the poverty reduction program, but they're not living, you know, super luxuriously. So a lot of the wealth of wealthy people in China was tied up in, in owning multiple properties. So by popping the real estate bubble, real estate prices have fallen pretty significantly, especially in big cities. And that has hurt a lot of wealthy Chinese, but it's also a way of reducing inequality. And as houses become more affordable, you have lower income Chinese who are able to buy a house, which reduces inequality. And especially considering that if you're very wealthy, most of your income doesn't come from your actual job. It comes from capital income. And a lot of that capital income was actually simply through capital gains in the force of rising housing prices, housing rising house house value. So, I mean, I know your question was ultimately about innovation. I talked about industrial policy and you can see that obviously China is innovating very well in semiconductors. It's catching up very quickly not only the most advanced chips, which people talk a lot about, but also what they call legacy chips, which are like a few years behind. And China is now dominating the entire global market in legacy chips. China is dominating in electric vehicles, in solar panels, and making other strides in other areas. So this idea that you only have to have private investment to have, to have uh, innovation is nonsensical. And I talked about how, in addition, as China is still innovating and investing heavily in certain technology te te technology sectors, China is also pursuing this campaign of common prosperity. And the idea is that yes, in the short term, we will face some economic problems. There has been a fall in demand, a fall in consumption, but a big part of that is because high income Chinese represented disproportionate amounts of consumption and demand. And, and now that, income is becoming a little more level and low income Chinese workers have more income. That means that the idea is that in the long term, aggregate demand will increase. 